Uh, welcome, everyone, and welcome, Michael. This is Michael's second time at the Institute. He was here four years ago uh, with his IMF hat. Uh, he worked in the IMF for almost 15, 15 years? No, IMF uh, 11, just under 11. 11 years. Uh, and as you know, he's now with the Bank of England. Um, fascinating presentation today on, on the role of the banking system uh, and uh, the two different sort of views of the banking system. Uh, so he's going to talk for about 30 minutes and we'll have plenty of time for Q&A after that. So Michael, can I hand over to you? Thank you. Thank you for the uh, introduction. This is uh, joint work with uh, Zoltan Yankov, who is my former colleague at the International Monetary Fund. The paper is about a year old. It came out as a bank agreement working paper in May last year. Um, so uh, here's the usual disclaimer that applies to both the Bank of England and the IMF. This is pure research. Right? Um, introduction. So following the global financial crisis, all the central banks uh, have been working on uh, making up for lost time, essentially, by putting uh, banks and financial markets back into models, especially for what is now known as macroprudential analysis, the use of prudential tools for macroeconomic purposes. Um, and I'm, I've been very involved with that at the, at the IMF and now at the Bank of England. And what I will uh, claim here today is that these recent models use uh, what I will call the intermediation of vulnerable funds theory of banking, uh, this is a term I made up, but it has the two terms in it that you will find all, in the, uh, all over the literature, namely that banks are intermediaries and that what they intermediate is global funds that have been deposited with them. And I will argue that this misrepresents the way that credit and money is created in the real world. Um, I will actually not talk about history very much, but we uh, mentioned it over lunch and we can get back to it during uh, question and answers. Uh, there is a very long uh, intellectual history uh, that makes the same point that, that I'm making here today, and uh, that current of thinking had actually won the debate by the early 1930s, um, and it lasted until about the early to mid-50s, and then this intermediation of global funds theory took over, sort of by stealth, partly also because uh, banking disappeared from the radar screen of the, macro, of the macroeconomics profession almost completely for many decades after that. And obviously we can no longer afford that. So the solution to what I call the problem with the intermediation of vulnerable funds theory is um, something that I call the financing through money creation theory. Again, I made that term up, but it, it essentially tells you what, uh, what banks do. They finance new loans by creating new money. And this, um, this is a fundamentally different story, and you will see that it has fundamentally different implications of how you think about financial shocks and how uh, they are transmitted to the real economy. I will argue that this is consistent with the actual credit creation process. There is a very nice, uh, there are two very nice Bank of England quarterly bulletin articles by my colleagues, McLay, Radia, and Thomas. Um, that explain this really for the layman. You don't need even an economics uh, degree or any kind of higher degree to understand uh, what they're saying in those articles. Uh, but it is basically exactly the story that I'm going to be telling you here today, but in much more technical terms. And uh, a little side story there, and I met John Vickers at, at a conference. Uh, he told me that when he teaches uh, money and banking, he uses a standard textbook, but when it comes to the credit and money creation process, he asks the student to put, put the book aside for a, for a bit and, use, and he uses these articles instead. Okay, so um, that should tell you something. So, um, I will now, before launching into what I think is wrong with the standard view, I, I, will, I will tell you what I actually do uh, in, in my formal modeling. And let's not think about so much the formal modeling, but about what story about the real world that actually tells you. I grew up as a student of Guillermo Calvo, a very famous, uh, grew up as an economist. Uh, as a student of Guillermo Calvo, he's very famous in international finance. Um, and uh, the class of models that we used in the classroom there were the standard models of the 80s and 90s where you would have money in the models, but it would be exogenous government money, and this money would be demanded by some representative household because of 
because it derives utility from it, because there is a cash advance constraint, or because it reduces his or her transactions cost. So that was very common. Uh, then uh, Michael Woodford, etc., took off, and, 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 and money was banished out of the models altogether. It was all just about prices, including interest rates, and not so much about quantities, or not at all in many cases. Okay, the argument that I'm going to be making here essentially is that the main shortcoming of this old family of models is not that they use a representative household, but rather that they look only at exogenous government money. Because the vast majority of money in today's economy that is actually relevant for the macroeconomic picture and for people being able to engage in transactions is created privately by the banking system. Not without the central bank having an influence, uh, but that influence is indirect. You need to look at both what the central bank does and what the private banking system does. Okay, and then you will have, and this is, this is a little maybe too technical, but uh, let, let's just focus on the intuition. In the loanable funds model, you would have something like a saver and a borrower. The saver deposits something in the bank, and then the bank takes it and lends it to the borrower. Right? And this is because this, typically the saver is patient, the borrower is impatient, something like that. And these, these guys or these people would have budget constraints which, says, which say uh, the change in my deposit is equal to my income minus my spending in very general terms. And let's just look at the saver. For the borrower it's basically the same story but in reverse because he's, he's not saving, he's, he's just saving his borrowing. So the saver accumulates deposit as a result of uh, generating extra income, for example, by sacrificing his leisure and working, or by spending less, for example, by just consuming less. Right? This, by nature, because it's a physical process, it's slow. Right? People would not just work 24 hours one week and zero hours the next because of something that happens in the economy. It's a slow process. And therefore, the change in deposits and the flip side of that on the other side of banks' balance sheet, the loans, is therefore generally slow in this, in this uh, family of models. Plus, if you look at how I've written this down, this is all entirely real. Income spending has nothing to do with money, right? whereas what banks do is essentially monetary. So in the family of models that I'm going to be presenting, Instead, I put, uh, I, 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 I put a representative household that interacts with the banking system and forget about this capital item, it's not essential to this debate. Uh, the representative household would have income and spending, but what is on the left-hand side of his balance sheet, uh, of, of, of his budget constraint, is the change in deposits minus the change in loans. Meaning that if a representative household wants to have more deposits from the bank because by using deposits, I can buy and sell machines, I can buy and sell cars, and this is useful for my economic transaction. And if I need more, I go to the bank and have the bank create this additional deposit for me. And I do that by getting a loan, let's say a loan of a million euros and a deposit of a million euros, and that deposit is then useful for transactions. I can spend it, but it'll also come back to me, it <coughs> circulates through the economy. Okay? <coughs> That has no longer not anything to do necessarily with income and spending. I can change my deposits by getting an, an additional loan and nothing in my income or spending as a first approximation has to change. Which tells you that in models like that, the changes in balance sheets can be very much more rapid. And as I will show you in the data, they are very rapid. And so this is an important feature. So, more on some general insights about banking. So this is basically, I just told you, what am I going to do in the family of models that I'm going to use to, and I'm going to just, in the end, produce one simulation that tells you what happens in a financial crash and how do these two model classes uh, behave under those circumstances. But first, some more general thoughts. Um, understanding banks. So two things that we need to get out of the way. First, banks are not intermediaries of loanable funds, so that is related to the intermediation story of banking that's out there. The other one is that the deposit multiplier is a myth, uh, because the deposit multiplier is another and distinct story out there about what banks do, and it is very, very, you know, I taught undergraduate money and banking for, for several years, and it's all over the textbooks, right? Um, Okay, so the first one, banks are not intermediaries of loanable funds. And this is a little dense, uh, but it's on purpose because every sub-bullet here corresponds to a sub-bullet down here uh, so that we can compare the two ways of thinking about banks. 
In the loanable funds model, the postulated credit process is essentially that intermediation consists of the physical trading of real resources. We go to great lengths in our paper to show you that if you look at the book entries that you need to create in order to make sense of an intermediation model, it cannot be anything to do with what we think of when it comes to banking, like we deposit a check in the bank. Because when I deposit a check in a bank that's drawn on some, somebody, my employer or something, gave me a check that was drawn on Barclays Bank and I deposited it in my Handelsbank account uh, uh, in London. This is, uh, this is not creating any new deposit. It is just moving a deposit from Barclays Bank to Handelsbank. And Handelsbank also doesn't have any additional money to lend when it gets my check because it has already lent it out the moment it gets it because it has an accounts receivable on Barclays Bank. Right? So there is, there is no additional deposit being created here, and the only way that you can think about intermediation where the, there would actually be additional deposits is that somebody would literally have to drive up to the bank with a truck and deposit some, don't know, grain, and tell the bank, intermediate this. Right? Literally, in terms of bookkeeping, nothing else makes sense. So in this model, banks collect a deposit of real resources from a saver and lend them to another agent, the borrower. Deposits in this model are therefore an input, right? Deposits in, loans out. Um, and the money in this model is essentially held as a store of value. You know, we know about the hierarchy of the three functions of money. Store of value, unit of account, and medium of exchange. It's a store of value story. And uh, in order to explain rapid changes in credit in this class of models, you would have to have uh, people saying, oh, I, don't, I no longer want to hold my savings in the bank. Instead, I directly want to hold uh, bonds and, 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 sh and stocks, uh, shares. Right? And then the bank balance sheet could suddenly shrink because people buy, use their bank deposits and, and to, to buy shares from their own bank and then hold those shares and bonds directly. I will show you in the data that that's just not what happens. That's just not the major thing behind real big changes in balance sheets. Instead, it's what comes next. So in the financing model, uh, uh, financing is the digital, cre digital creation of monetary purchasing power. It happens on a computer. There's no truck involved. It's all just uh, uh, digits on a computer. So when, uh, when somebody came to me, I worked for Barclays Bank for five years, so, so if somebody uh, came, came to me in, into the bank and, and it was a good business plan and I approved a loan, I would create an, an entry of a million pounds on the asset side of my, the bank's balance sheet, and at the same time create an entry in the name of the same person on the liability side, which was the deposit that this person came to the bank for, and he or she would then take that deposit and spend it on the actual purpose. Uh, of the loan. So at the moment when a new loan is made, there is no intermediation. It's just all with, between the bank and one person. And then people will tell me, yes, but you're ignoring the second step. The second step is that then that person would go and take that money and spend it on something and then the depositor ends up being someone else. At which point I say, yes, but you are ignoring the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth step, which is that once that money is then received by that other person, it would then be spent on the goods that I have produced uh, using that money in the first place. So, so th th let's think about an example. I'm, I'm a company owner. I come to the bank. I want to pay additional workers to put additional uh, goods on my shelf. So I would, um, I would get a loan from the bank. So as I said, no intermediation. I have a deposit. I have a loan. Now I spend the deposit and by, uh, by paying my workers. So now the workers are the depositors and I owe my workers. But what's the next thing that's going to happen? Like at, at a very high and abstract level. The workers are going to spend the money in order to buy the goods that I have just produced. Like macroeconomically, that's what happens. And the money comes back to me. So it, it, it doesn't matter that at a particular snapshot moment in time, uh, the, the depositor and the, and the borrower are not the same person. What matters is that when the new loan gets created, there is no intermediation. Um, there, is, uh, there is money creation, okay? Um, deposits in this model are therefore an output, right? The loan is made in order to create the deposit. Loan in, deposit out. Uh, money in this model is held essentially as a medium of exchange. I do this whole trans... Why would I ever go to the bank and get a loan of a million pounds and pay 5% interest on it and get a deposit that pays 2 or 0% interest? I would do this because the deposit is our generally accepted medium of exchange in the economy. 
That's why I do this. Okay? Um, and then, as we will see when we look at data, when you think through what banks do through that lens, um, then you can explain rapid changes in bank balance sheet by banks grossing up or down their balance sheet uh, in response to macroeconomic conditions. Okay? Okay, so what you will see when you read a lot of academic papers and semi-academic papers is the standard story for banks is always there's a saver, there's a deposit, there's a loan, and somebody else gets it. What I'm arguing is that the arrows actually go the other way around. There is uh, an investor gets a loan in order to get a deposit. He or she then uses that deposit in order to do something with it. This, by the way, only holds for banks, not for non-bank financial institutions. Non-bank financial institutions are actually much closer to this mm -hmm. up here. Um, except that what they intermediate is not goods. What they intermediate is uh, bank balances. Right? Yeah, uh, right. Uh, the corollary of this, saving does not finance investment, financing does. I think that's very important when you think about productivity of finance, etc. There are two very nice uh, papers by a German economist called Lindner who argues that aggregate financial saving is sort of a zero-sum game. If I decide that I want to do additional saving in the bank, for example, by uh, when my employer pays me, I'm going to save more than I used to. Right? I'm going to keep that money in the bank. Right? Uh, that does not increase the aggregate amount of deposits and loans in the economy. It just means that I keep a larger, larger share of what already exists. Right? The only way that the aggregate balance sheet of the financial sector can grow is by additional financing decisions, additional loans that create additional deposits. Right? That's financial saving. Real saving, and this goes back all the way to Keynes and probably earlier than that, is equal to investment as an accounting residual. Saving is equal to investment is not an equilibrium condition. You cannot say, oh, people should save more so that there should be more investment. What you should, what, the way you ought to think about this, in my view, is that there, needs to be, there need to be conditions that are conducive to productive investment. And uh, one important condition for that is a banking system that finances productive investments uh, uh, and responds to market conditions to do so. Um, and, 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 and so uh, you, you cannot say that saving finances investment in that sort of mechanical sense, if I save more, then there will be more investment. The, the logic is actually that if I finance additional investment, if the bank has good loan officers, they, they spot a good opportunity, the firm goes out and spends the additional money that has been created, um, then saving in the macroeconomic real sense is just a consequence. Saving is equal to investment, that saving is just an accounting residual, and it has to be equal to investment by definition, not by equilibrium. It's a definition, right? So macroeconomic uh, saving is equal to investment uh, by in a closed economy. Of course, there are complications in an open economy. Okay? Um, and so saving is a consequence, not a cause of bank lending. Um, the deposit multiplier is a myth. Um, we, we all know about the deposit multiplier from the undergraduate textbook. The Nobel Prize winners Kidlin and Prescott showed in 1990 that actually the uh, actual monetary transmission works in the opposite direction in the sense that broad money, which is created by banks, <coughs> leads the cycle and narrow money, which is uh, provided by the central bank, very narrow money, uh, lags the cycle. So the, the banks decide first how much broad money they are going to create and the creation of reserves is, uh, is a result. Under inflation targeting, this is actually obvious. Uh, almost all central banks nowadays, nowadays uh, do some version of inflation targeting. You're basically controlling in a market with supply and demand curve, you're controlling the price. Then you need to let the quantity adjust. And the quantity in this market is the quantity of reserves. So a reserve, the quantity of reserves is therefore endogenous. So in just one sentence, um, uh, this comes from a 1969 uh, um, paper or speech by Alan Holmes, vice president at the time of the New York Federal Reserve. Reserve. In the real world, banks extend credit, creating deposits in the process, and look for the reserves later. So it goes from loans to deposits to reserves. Um, and I will now uh, show you that this matters when you think about macroeconomic simulations to especially credit shocks. And I build, so we build models, but I, I don't want to go into too much technical details, but I want to say some basic things about 
uh, the models in, at, at a high uh, level of, uh, of presentation rather than going into equations and things like that. So I'm talking about, uh, talking about bank balance sheets actually being explicitly modeled with loans deposit uh, uh, on one side and deposits and equity on the other side. So what is the distinctive feature about bank assets? Well, it's what we just talked about. Bank assets get, get created and funded um, not by lending out pre-existing funds but by creating uh, money. Um, there are no loanable funds, and this is something I, I say typically uh, to provoke academics uh, a little bit into thinking. Um, when it comes to the loanable funds theory, as far as banks are concerned, again, non-bank, non-bank financial institutions are different. When it comes to banks, there are no loanable funds. When I sat in my chair as a bank, a bank place lending manager, I did not look over my shoulder and see, or, or in, into my computer to see, do we have some loanable funds? No. The, the, the funds existed entirely in my mind. I said, if this is a good business proposition, I'm going to create these funds. Okay, that's, that's how that worked. Um, as far as liabilities are concerned, um, I, I will basically say that they do something very, that they do something essential for the economy. They, and that's where the link to the real economy is. The banks do this and um, uh, create money, and that money facilitates transactions. It makes it cheaper to buy and sell stuff, and that provides a stimulus to the real economy uh, when they do that. And so, again, uh, in order to debunk a very common uh, uh, statement that you will find in literature that says, oh, banks collect deposits and then lend them out, uh, in a macroeconomic sense, that's not right. Banks do not collect deposits from non-banks. I, I talked to you earlier about that when I deposit my uh, check drawn on Barclays Bank in my Handels Bank, and, uh, Handels Bank and account, that is not a bank collecting a deposit from me. It's a bank collecting a deposit from another bank because as soon as I deposited it, the value will be collected from Barclays Bank, not from me, right? Uh, so so I, I do not put anything else into the banking system by depositing this check. So in that sense, banks do not collect deposits from non-banks. Um, bank equity will be modeled as subject to Basel regulation, uh, and I think I can, switch, uh, I, I can uh, uh, jump over the rest. And then I will present models that are, the only point I want to make in this context is models that I present are identical, except that one difference that I showed you earlier with those budget constraints, that in one case, the bank literally has to go to one set of agents, collect savings, and then lend them out to the other set of agents. Whereas in the model with the representative household, there is one bank dealing with one agent who came to the bank in order to get additional money created for him or her. And that's, what, that's the only difference. Everything else in the model is kept the same so that when we see differences, we know where they come from. They can only come from one source. Right? And so this is kind of the heart of the intuition of what's going on, and it's, it, it looks a little messy, but I think uh, I, need, I wanted all the essential variables in one place uh, to tell a complete story. So what we have here is a shock where the banker wakes up in the morning and all his borrowers have suddenly become a lot more uh, risky. Um, could be any, could be some political event, whatever. Uh, so, or, or uh, in some, some country where there is a major storm and suddenly a lot of businesses are flattened or something like that. So the, the, it, 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 that, that's sort of the story that we want to talk about here. So the borrowers have become more risky. And this is not just in the mind of the banker in this model. This is actually, this is actually real. And then we have here, how does the macroeconomy respond? And on the horizontal axis, in each case, we have 16 quarters, i.e. four years. And this is highly illustrative. Don't take the magnitudes, don't, don't look at the magnitudes too closely because this has, is not based on any kind of estimated model. It's an illustrative simulation. And in the right column here, we have the financial variables in the economy. And in the left column, we have the real variables. And I will tell the story starting with the financial variables. So this banker wakes up in the morning and says, my borrowers are suddenly a lot more risky. I need to adjust. In which case, he or she can do two things, lend less, or lend at a higher interest rate to compensate for the higher risk. The dashed line in each case represents a loanable funds model where people have to save or dissave in order for something to change with the deposits. The solid line is the financing model. 
With the financing model, bank deposits change over time, but very gradually. Because people have to start disabling for the banker to be able to do something. So the banker, who nevertheless sees elevated risk, charges a much higher risky spread for his loans to uh, his borrowers. And so there's a big increase of 200 basis points in this particular case uh, in the price uh, of, of loans. And then also we have leverage. The bank leverage uh, in this model is, uh, is um, countercyclical, meaning that leverage goes up in a crash. And what we know from recent empirical literature is that actually leverage is procyclical. It tends to go up in a boom and down in a crash. Okay. Why does leverage go up in a crash in this economy? It's because there is a lot of action in bank net worth. It declines. The bank makes losses here because there's been a bad shock to the quality of the loan portfolio. Bank takes a hit, but not much happens with assets and liabilities, at least on impact. It takes a long time for that something to happen with assets and liabilities. That means because leverage is assets divided by net worth, and net worth goes down, leverage goes up. Right? Okay, uh, now as I will say is later in the data, leverage is actually pro-cyclical, like in the financing model. What, what happens in the financing model is the banker wakes up in the morning, again says, I want to lend less at a higher interest rate. But in this case, lending less is not a problem. Lending less is one of the things that he, he or she can easily do uh, by calling in uh, loans uh, as, they, as, as they mature. And so here, the bank balance sheet contracts by 5% in a single quarter. Sounds like a crazy magnitude, but actually, later we look at the data, it's not that crazy. And uh, that means that the loan-to-value ratios of the remaining banks, uh, of the remaining borrowers, are now down, right? Because the banks are lending less to them, which means that they don't need to increase the spread by quite as much, right? So more action on the quantity side, a little bit less action on the price side. Now, if we go to the real variables now, um, the, the key link between these two things, the financial and the real variables, is something that I call the effective price of investment and consumption. And what that measures is the ease of doing business as a result of having enough money circulating in the economy. Right? When you suddenly withdraw a lot of money from the economy, people can no longer do the purchases that they thought they would be able to do. Think of small and medium-sized uh, enterprises in the US, for example, uh, after the, the crash of 2008. They were streaming, they couldn't get credit, therefore they couldn't get money, therefore they couldn't purchase what they wanted to purchase. <coughs> okay? So in the financing model, what happens in this crash is that the effective price of consumption investment goes up because there is so much less liquidity. As you can see here, bank deposits liquidity decreases a lot, whereas in the other model, that's actually not what's going on, at least not on impact. And that's why you get a much bigger contraction in output uh, in consumption and in investment, it's, it's about twice as large in this particular uh, simulation because the action is not just here through the price channel, through the real interest rate, although that action is also there, but it is also um, the, uh, the, the, the lack of money, so to speak, in the economy, and that makes everything worse. And that's an aspect that is completely ignored uh, by a typical uh, loanable funds model. So that was... I mean, there's a lot more in the paper, but we have only so much time. And remember some of what we discussed here, because now we're going to look at data. So there are three interrelated predictions that we have seen in this, in this simulation. First, credit and money can exhibit large and discontinuous jumps. Uh, second, bank leverage is procyclical. And third, credit pressures have a large credit rationing component. There's evidence for all of these in the data. I don't really have much time, any time to talk about three, uh, maybe a little bit about two, mostly about one. So here we, uh, we have scatter plots uh, for six national banking systems that plot on the horizontal axis the change in the log of assets, i.e. the percent change in assets, against on this axis the percent change in equity, which are the blue dots, and the percent change in, uh, uh, in, in debt, uh, which are the red dots. And as in a... Uh, famous paper by Hyun Shin and co-authors, uh, what you see is that the uh, red dots are on something close to a 45 degree line. What that means is that changes in assets are matched more or less one for one by changes in debt. Uh, 
And this is not just for individual banks, but for national banking systems. Now, you can struggle mightily, and some people have done so successfully using a loanable funds model, uh, in order to create this effect. It is possible, but you have to struggle hard. And our model is not even an issue, right? That's what happens naturally, because when you increase loans, you increase deposits uh, in, in the, at, the, at the same moment as the result of the same bookkeeping transaction. Um, also, what, what you should look at is, is the magnitude, and you might not be able to see that from the back of the room, uh, four, five, six percent in a given quarter uh, is not that uncommon. And this is, a, uh, this is national banking system balance sheets, and this even holds after you take out valuation effects, and it even holds after you, after you take out bank, uh, interbank lending. This also holds for just credit to the non-bank uh, private sector. Um, let me skip over this because I, time is a little bit short. Um, now let's look at uh, the magnitudes of bank financing in the United States and how they change and which model might line up with that. Okay? Uh, so what we have here um, is the, the change in millions of US dollars in uh, various uh, categories of credit uh, between the early 90s and 2012. And the black line is overall credit. And you see that there was a huge collapse in credit at the time of uh, the financial crisis uh, in the United States. Uh, on the previous slide, we also show that if you plot saving against this national saving from the national accounts, it actually goes the opposite way, which would tell you, oh, people saved more. There must have been more bank deposits, right? Doesn't make any sense. What happened is that the banking systems compressed. The assets and the liabilities were compressed together. The loans were called in, the deposits canceled. I mean, I'm talking about loans and deposits in a very general sense. I mean, all liabilities of the banking system, uh, essentially. Um, now, what some authors have claimed is that, oh, this must be because there has been a substitution to a different form of non-bank financing. For example, holding bonds directly, which, were, which are these blue bars, and the magnitudes are the same. There was not very much of that. There was a little blip here, uh, but no. This was, this was not a switching between different forms of financing. It was a contraction in the overall amount of financing. So our model has a very easy time explaining this, whereas the, 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 the standard model struggles. Here is also, we add, this time we just look at corporate financing, which was one of the lines that declined rapidly uh, on the previous slide. And then we look at bond financing, and here is equity financing, because you might say, okay, maybe the firms didn't issue additional bonds to households, but they issued equity. Um, you see that that's also not part of the story. It does not offset what happened to credit at the time of the crisis. Um, and finally, we look at the contribution of households. Now, you know, this is from the flow of funds, US flow of funds, and you can look at the contribution of different sectors to this change in corporate financing. Where's the household sector involved in there? That's, that's what it would have to be if you tell the story in terms of the loanable funds model, where the household decides, am I going to invest in the banking system or am I going to invest in stocks and bonds? And we see that, no, the, the change in the household's position, either equity or bonds vis-a-vis -vis the corporate sector, was, was small to negligible compared to the overall decline in financing that happened uh, in the financial system. Leverage is procyclical. Banks lever up in a boom and down in a crisis because their assets and liabilities move even more than their equity. Right? And so Nuno and Thomas have a, a very well-known paper that, that looks at this, and they basically look at the correlation of leverage with GDP. And we do the same, but we look at also at lags of GDP, because banks do not always immediately react to a big uh, credit event, because they have things called pre-committed credit lines, whereby borrowers in a crisis might actually draw on pre-committed credit lines, even though the banks would rather wish they didn't, because they would, they would rather get out, but legally, that's not possible. And it takes about a year or something like that until you can, until you can cut those credit lines. Right? And uh, so if you allow for lags of output, then you see that consistently and across countries, and we show that in the paper, leverage is pro-cyclical. Right? So conclusions. The key contribution of this paper was to just put 
a framework on the table by which we can think about uh, the, the, the financing view of banking, which, as I indicated briefly at the beginning, was very common in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. This was um, a, 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 an older professor at, uh, emeritus in London uh, told me that uh, when I uh, grew up as an economist, what you're telling us was conventional wisdom, right? It was a long time ago. Um, but I'm basically trying to put a modern modeling tool on the table that can tell this story in a consistent way. And what we found when we do that, by quantitatively simulating such a model, it predicts far larger and far faster changes in bank lending, which arguably you see in the data. Uh, it predicts much smaller changes in spreads. Right? Whether you see that in the data, it's sort of hard to... Uh, we're actually doing cutting-edge empirical work now, not just looking at stylized facts, but actually estimating these models. It also predicts larger effects on the real economy. Okay? And the stylized facts we have just seen. Uh, I'm involved at the Bank of England uh, in, in sort of coming up with research projects that look at the interaction of banks with the real economy, um, especially for microprudential policy analysis, and virtually the, the entire literature uses some variant of the loanable funds model and what, what I'm concluding from this work is that much mileage can be gained from looking at the questions that we, over the last five, six, seven, eight years, have already been studying, again, through the lens of this different model class. And I think it will give us certainly quantitatively different answers, in some cases perhaps also uh, qualitatively different answers. So, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.